will have me, Alex, Sally, and the two more people. Are ready? I'm going to work in real time. I work in real time. This is my brain, so we'll figure it out before we ask this class. I'm sorry. I'm sorry about the heat. We will make sure we turn that on. Earlier. Sorry. It's a friend's best. It's a friend's best. It's a just kind of what has been happening to everybody since we met. Uh, any, um, this is calm, but anything, um, I want to, something I want to share. Anything happened that was like out of the ordinary or not? Yes. Oh, I got a No, and it was my fault. I've never, never had like a warning. I've never got a ticket or anything. Saturday. Was something bad? Well, no, it wasn't that. Oh, good. We got an hour on it together. Come here. Come here. Oh, good. Got an hour. That looks good. That looks good. You want some? I'll get it. You talk. What happened? What happened? Well, I mean, you know, nobody at this juncture knows enough about anybody to share things that are. Yes, yeah, see, I don't know really what close, to say. Really close, close to heart. That's fine. It's some stuff. It's been like, yeah. Okay. It's okay. Um, anybody else? Can I? Wait, I do have some. I started, I think I was supposed to be using me and God, but I started a fast um, last Wednesday, and I have been more focused on, um, you know, just kind of quickening, like when the things are going
So, is the audio still intact? Audio is still intact. Okay, very good. Just me. So, and we'll, by, the, by the end of the course, we'll have that all improved. Yeah. so much. There's a lot of the word is just turning the light on. You know? And exposing and just like you can't do this anymore. Anybody else? We're just talking about things that have happened since Saturday. Um, actually, good or bad. This is not Just But we, we have to speak up or you cannot hear it Son, but I've been trying to get a hold of his probation officer. And I, when I first met her, too, I just felt something there. I don't know what. But I wasn't sure. But she kind of me today. I'm sick and weak with her. But I share stuff about me that they want to give my son something like a shot. And they want to give me a shot. He needs counseling, and I want to try to get him back with her. Because she don't know about teen challenge, but whatever. But I started sharing stuff about me. They said, I want to do those things. I'm a religious person too. I tried to start sharing stories about mission trips and stuff like that. And she, and so I want to see her Friday morning at 10 o'clock in the morning. I, I went out and do some meet with her. I want to invest for my son. And I, want, and I don't think that whatever they want to give him is not the answer. You've got to be sent somewhere soon. You don't have one there, so you have to go somewhere. The guy with the door, he's sitting in the rock. Well, I'm not doing nothing right here. It's my time to come. I'm going to go here. I'm going to share my heart. I just really feel like there's been tearing the 
flesh. For Sally's sake, the, the thing with Jacob. Actually, I'll, I'll hold it to because I'll put it in. Just remind Because that's actually, it's a very, it's a very important part of the whole process. Of that's why I should have this. So, um, well, today, one of the things Let me ask a quick question. When I bring up the first word, only one word, I'm going to say one. You've got to say the word that first comes to your mind when I say this word. Even if you're the last person to share, you can say this word. Just ask them, what's the first word that comes up when I say the word anger? One word. What comes to your mind? They've all done it. Hatred. Hatred. 
hatred? Yeah. Okay. Um, venom. Venom. Okay. Okay, this is a true or false question. When I'm angry, I feel really close to God. One answer is no. I want, I want to touch on something really, really, uh, really quickly. Actually, now is a perfect time for me to be able to share that with you. Then I'll, then I'll, then I'll share with you kind of where some of the stuff is going to um, The, um, yeah. yeah, it's a good time because you heard the story. And I won't answer before you do. Um, this is pretty much for you guys. I shared on Saturday about Jacob actually um, because they're they're foundational characters to what the Lord's going to do in us. Um, you can listen to the the thing should be up tonight. Most of it you can't see because for some reason the camera didn't go on, but you can hear. Um, but in the situation with Jacob, Jacob is at a place where his name means deception. And I'm going to really agree with this. Uh, his name means deception. Every day he's called to see him. Every day he's called life. And he lives under that. He becomes a deceiver. He deceives not only his own brother, but his own dad. Um, he steals things from both of them. Things that, that was their right to have and to give. So eventually down, down the line, his brother becomes a warrior, and, um, and he is a farmer. He has bunches of animals. His, um, uh, his brother has bunches of warriors. And he finds out his brother's coming to visit him, and he realize, realizes this is a I'm in trouble. He separates his family, and he goes and spends the night Actually, before this, it says that when he heard that he was coming, it says he reached for what was closest to him. It's a critical statement. Oh, actually, Sally is um, It's a critical statement because when when you are willing to relinquish that which is most important to you, is the is the place that change is about to happen. But you have to relinquish that. You have to do that. In my own life. Came in 1995. Uh, they were very powerful. There were three things I never wanted to lose. Never. One was my marriage. Another was one of them I used a little bit later, my kids. And the other was my son. I lost all three. And, um, and those are the very things that were the, the most valuable in my own mindset growing up in the home I grew up. We all have different values based on that. But, but basically, Jacob reaches, it says when he heard that his brother was coming, he reached for what was closest to him. Uh, the animals that were probably closest to him, the ones that he, you know, that, that were, were probably his pets more than they were uh, uh, the, uh, anything beyond that. And, and, and so that was basically the thing that, that occurred there. And, um, and then the very next thing that happened was that he ended up, um, the next, he wrestles with, with God. And it was, it was the pre incarnate Jesus who had laid aside all of his rights. Theologically, I'm not going to go into that time. Laid aside everything, laid aside the power. Laid, and as a result, the pre incarnate Jesus could not overpower uh, Jacob. Jacob had actually, we also talked about the fact that God is not going to overpower you. Issues that are yours, that that there were issues 
the only one who can overpower the issues in your life is you. And so, um, which is one of the things we often teach, you know, have, let God break this off of you, let God break this off of you. It's actually, you need to break this off and you need to open up an access way for God to get in. Because until you break your stubbornness, until you break your pride, until you break and it's not going to happen. And, um, and that's why we struggle even with our kids sometimes. Because our kids, like, they know the truth, they've been taught the truth, they've been raised in all kinds of truth. But they're stubborn. And they, they know the right things, but they don't necessarily do the right things. So as a result, we're just like, hello, come on, let God touch you. Let but there's, and God is not going to break through to them. They have to reach the point themselves where they will, they will be up with themselves. That's what Jacob deals with in the middle of the night. The next day he goes out, he, he sees his brother, and he actually goes in the front. He, he owned his problem. He owned, he didn't hide anymore. He was not afraid of it. He may have been afraid, I shouldn't say that. He may have been very afraid of what was about to happen. But he knew that the first one to die in this battle is going to be me. It's what David did. David um, sinned and counted the fighting men of Israel. And God sent an angel across the land to be wiping out people. David went to the threshing floor and stood there and said, Stop it. Kill me. Don't kill me. And, and it's a reality of understanding that we have the issue, and when we take responsibility for the issue, that's what God God um, So that was pretty much that, except for the one thing, that when Jacob sees his brother, his brother said, why are you doing all this stuff? What are you doing? And you don't need to do all this. And, uh, and, he's, and he responds and he says, when I look at you, I see the face of God. Most of us have, have, been, have grown up in a religious system that teaches that God is on you, everybody will notice him, everybody will see God on you, and don't respond accordingly. It's actually what brings about a lot of entitlement that people feel like they have. Can't you tell God's on you? I have faith. Can't you see that? And so as a result, we operate literally out of a religious spirit where we believe I'm something. <coughs> when in fact, Jacob dealt with it in the exact opposite way. He said, no, you don't understand. I look at you, and in you, I see the face of God. I see the things that God is causing me to face in you, and I'm grateful for that. Because when I see the fact that he raised you up in my life, and even though I deceived you and everything else, I am here now face to face with my own issues. And when I become face to face with my own issues, I actually, <coughs> I actually can become more like Jesus. And uh, because you can be honest, you can be really honest. And so that's that's the Jacob part. The second part that I touched on was Peter. And with Peter, uh, I mean, he was the most gregarious, boisterous, whatever. He's a wonderful guy, constantly putting his feet in the air. Um, um, and I did say feet, not foot. <coughs> Uh, he was just somebody who was constantly out there. He was bold. Uh, he was he was the braggadocious one. He probably exaggerated tons. He would he would represent very clearly uh, what it, what it's like to be a um, uh, an individual who is. Um, uh, In today's world, in today's ministry, he would be a ministry leader, hands down, no problem. Uh, because he know he, he knows how to hype things up. He knows how to make how to how to put tents on mountains. Um, you know, after the glory comes, like this is it, this is all, this is it, this is it, this is it. And and he knows how to do that. He, but he deals with an issue that's his own issue. Peter Peter could not deal. Not be accepted. He had to be accepted. Constantly had to be accepted. And as a result of that, Peter was placed through a major, major test. And in fact, Jesus actually said, Peter, Satan is asked to sift you. And he said, God's going to let him sift you. And it's one of the most crazy places in Scripture because you realize. Only Job did this happen to before he came. But 
basically, um, it was like he he's about to go through a test, and God thinks he can pass the test. It's again about God's not going to put you through any test and allow you to go through any test. But he's a he does not believe he can pass. He trusts you. He really does. So he goes to Peter, and he says, um, uh, yeah, you're going to deny me. And Peter's like, no, you don't understand. You don't know who I am. Well, that night, he's tested three times. And uh, and I related it a little bit more to a, to a world that we live in now. So he says, oh, you know that guy. Like, yeah. And, um, and uh, yeah, hey, you're from the same area as him. And um, and finally he, he said, Yeah, you're one of those guys. And he swore he was trying to emphasize or de-emphasize his association with Jesus. In standing the kingdom, you will constantly be brought into a situation where in order to be cool and accepted, it doesn't take a lot. Peter's lies, you know, when you read about him lying, you got to his lies, white lies, we're talking about this last week, white lies are lies. And I shared with these guys last week that the person who taught me a lot, who is an incredible woman, loved her dearly, um, was loved by everybody. Nobody would ever have even seen this as an issue that she had personally. But my mom, and she said, don't tell your dad. She would give me little bits of money here and there to go do whatever it was I wanted to do as a teenager. And what she did is she sewed in me deception. She sewed in me, you don't always need to be honest. You don't always need to be truthful. You can share pieces of truth enough that it's true, but it's not all true. And so as a result, it deceives. Peter, dealt with that kind of thing. And the cock crows, Jesus, now, and I shared this thing. I said, but the only one who was ever asked those questions of all the disciples, the only one was me. None of the others were asked those questions. So the battle that he went through, none of the others went through. So we can't look at it and say, um, you're a horrible disciple. The reality is he said, Jesus evidently did not think the other disciples were even confident in the Okay. Um, or needed that specific testimony and um, the, the test of deception. So, um, anyways, comes the end, Jesus restores him on the beach, and um, do you like me? Yeah. And eventually he becomes the leader after he answers that. Third time. You love me. Are you willing to lay down your life for me? Yes. He said, You are going to absolutely touch the world. To this day, let me just tell you, other than other than um, the Pope's claiming Peter as the first Pope, Peter went to, uh, I'm sorry, not Peter, Thomas. Uh, Another one who was greatly tested in the resurrection ended up going to India. His name, to this day, it was a church called Mount Thomas. It's the Church of Thomas that is still there to this day. That the impact that these guys had literally have lasted uh, millennia. They have they have impacted to such a degree, and and so when God. God comes on us when He impacts us, when He carries us through and may be tested. It, it is for future fruit. It's that, it's that years from now, years from now, when you're gone, there is a legacy you have left to, to individuals who will be walking in the same foot, footsteps as you, realizing they did it, I can. And that's actually one of the promises of Scripture, which says, We know that our brethren throughout the whole earth are 
are enduring the same kind of suffering. The easiest way to preach is to understand what you're going through, and many others are too. People say, where do you come from? Talk to me. I walk through life. What do you mean? I know what people are going through. Are you just <coughs> slotting everybody? It's like, no. I just know that the scripture says, we know that your brethren have got the earth but the same things. So if you are asking for, and, and in communication, this will come a little bit later, but in communication to others, ask yourself, if I'm in this person's situation, what would I want to hear? What would be the most valuable and important thing that could revolutionize my life if I was in this situation and somebody came and they said something to me? See, that immediately will remove religious stuff. You know why I will remove religious stuff? Because you don't want to hear religious stuff. You do not want to hear um, Romans 8, 28. God works all things together for good to those who love it. Nobody wants to really hear that. They don't want to hear that in the midst of their crisis. It's like, oh, this will be for good. There's no compassion with that. There's no empathy. There's no sense that, that God really cares. It's like it's written, so therefore. And, um, and we're not battling the devil here. That's Jesus only did that with the devil. You understand that? Where Jesus said, it is written. He only did that with Satan. He only did that with a Pharisaical spirit. He never did it when he was ministering to people. He never did. Why? Because it comes across, it's very religious. So back to the question, the reason I asked you those questions. Remember the first question? What did I say was the first one? When I bring up the word anger, first thing that comes to your mind is one word, anger. Resentment. Huh? Resentment. Okay. And the second one was true or false. Um, when I'm angry, I feel close to God. When I'm angry, I feel close to God. Not a trick question, true or false. Now, and we have both. This is perfect. I'm gonna I want I want to help you understand emotions in an incredibly godly way. God has emotions. God never considered anger sin. Oh, really? In Ephesians, he says, be angry, yet without sin. So what does that mean? It means there's two ways to respond to emotion. You can respond to emotion legitimately, or you can respond to emotion in a way that produces carnal reaction. Okay? So, you read David, and it'll help, actually help you understand a lot more scripture if you understand anger's not wrong. Because you'll begin reading, you'll read about, um, it, it really kind of goes through the whole gamut of all, pretty much all the servants of scripture. You go to Abraham, you go to Moses, you go to Moses, it's like, yo, I'm really ticked off. These are your people. They're not mine. I never asked for this job. What do you think? He was angry. He was totally angry. There's a reason I'm telling you this. We're going to go a little further than that. My friend once, see, I used to deal with, I, I was raised in a very religious family. And I say religious, you know something. I love my parents. I honor my parents. So my dad still travels around the world. My dad has come light years in the last 20 years. Light years from where we were. But we lived under the notion very, very strict, very, you know, when I was first early in, in the 
uh, in life. I mean, you know, you didn't you didn't play cards. Uh, you didn't play. You certainly didn't do certain things on Sundays, and uh, you had to dress a certain way, and you had to um, act a certain way. We had learned that behavior was godly, and and so we we learned that if you don't if you don't behave yourself, that you're in sin. So we grew up with the sin thing that came and, and came all over our life. And it would take me years um, to figure out that that's not really the way that God ever intended for us um, to, to live under the, the weightiness of, oh my gosh, I'm just... uh, But in that, anger was considered <coughs> sin. There were other emotions that were sinful. There were others that were like godly. So... So joyfulness was godly and anger was sin. Even though, even though you're you're just having a reaction to life, this is godly and this other one is sin. And so we we, we learn to respond to life that way. And in fact, most religious systems um, that have have risen in the church have become part of it. Um, so I remember that that there were things that I was dealing with and I was like, but I am angry. And in fact, I'm not, I'm not wanting to hurt anybody, but I'm angry. That hurt me. It was devastating to me and it was devastating to others. And Jesus, you got angry. Yeah, what about that? You went into the temple and, and you actually got angry. You literally overturned their tables. That's a reaction. You told them. You told them things that were negative, that were bad about their lives. You have made my father's house a den of thieves. I mean, he's, he calls the Pharisees whitewashed tombs. He calls them dead man's bones. I mean, today, those probably would not be the language that we use. We, some of us, in, in, our, in our settings and in the mindset that we've been growing up, some of us might be like totally taken back. Did Jesus really say that? John Wimber, 20 years ago, 25 years ago, meeting with us pastors and in meetings, I remember people having prophetic words. I remember this one woman who just thought she had this incredible prophetic word for all these pastors and leaders. And, um, and so she gets up and man, it is just so demeaning and wrong and controlling and religious and, and she's giving this word and right, right as she's about ready to finish he just says, he stands up and says, oh shut up and sit down. The word's not from God. And, you know, there's a silence across the room. You're like, oh, my, 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 what just happened? And he says, I know that lady. We'll talk. He says, I just want you to know that's not the nature of God. God doesn't beat up his people, and particularly he doesn't beat up his leaders. He doesn't pick, he doesn't beat up his sheep. But he particularly does not beat up his leaders. The leaders are the ones who are pressing into stuff nobody else is willing to do. They're the ones that are taking all the heat. God is so proud of leaders. It doesn't matter if they're screwing up and they aren't the best. He's proud of them. And, it, and, and it's, if the sooner we begin acknowledging that leaders have issues, but God has allowed them to be in a in a fishbowl where everybody gets to see their leaders or, and, and see the issues and we begin to realize, wait a second, I'm not in a fishbowl like they are. Maybe God trusts them even with their issues. And I'm glad I'm not in that fishbowl. It changes the whole nature of things. So I'm getting, I'm getting to the whole thing of emotion for a very specific reason. Because of foundations of where we're headed. If we're going to be family, 
certain things have to be true. So this guy was a really close friend of mine. I thought. It was Kevin. He's happened in South Carolina. And uh, Kevin's the same one who said to me, just think, this massive issue that you're going through right now, and it was horrible. My life was exploding, growing up. He said, just think, this amazing thing you're walking through, that after you finish this one, there's a bigger one coming. I was like, I don't punch you, man. I, you know, I, that's not what I want to hear. I don't want to hear that there's greater, but you, you know one of the things I've been very aware of? There's always greater things. That God's taking us from glory to glory, and, and the only way to go through from glory to glory is to go further and further and further. And, and the reality is, is that at every juncture, all hell will fight you. All hell will fight you. And um, so, and it's no option. It's really to quit. <coughs> I'll kill you anyways. So, so that was kind of the um, the piece I was I was uh, saying in that regard. But basically, um, with the anger, he looks at me because he gets angry. Oh no, I'm sorry. We got angry at each other. I fought long. Basically, I was just kind of moving on in my life. Left him. And so, I guess we were friends. The next time he sees me, he looks at me. So, you mean if we're angry with each other, we can't be friends? You mean if we disagree that you're just going to cut off this relationship that it's not that valuable to you? Then I began realizing how many people had said to me, your family. I said, oh, your family. I had one. It was a, a woman with her two daughters, precious. Um, they moved to South Carolina. Moved. From New England. They moved all the way down there. They came and they were part of our family. There were some things that she just did that were not. They weren't cool with me, they weren't cool with my wife, they weren't cool with other people who have been hanging with me for a long time. And they were basically just kind of bulldozing their way in and making um, executive decisions, and they weren't an executive. And so there were certain things they were told, please don't do this, we don't need this, it's just going to cost us extra money. And she did it anyways. It was like, so basically we just said, hey, you know, I wanted to do that. I didn't need to do that. But I wasn't cutting anything off. But within a week, I said, hey, can talk? I said, sure. I came over and it was like, you don't understand this. You don't understand me. You don't understand me. So we really I thought you said we were family. Yeah, well, obviously you do. I said, oh, wait a second. I said, if we're family, if we're family, that doesn't happen. I believe the foundation of what we're doing here is family. Some of you know me longer than others. One of the things I've learned about family and about knowing people is that I promise you things will be said about people. How many of you know that? Mm -hmm. And in our world, we become comfortable with gossip or maligning or talking about. We become comfortable. We, it's become acceptable. But here's what I know. As I get to know people, as, as, as we get to know each other, 
Somebody could say anything they wanted. I go, nah, I know Arnold. I've been around the world with Arnold. I've seen Arnold on bad days. I've seen him on good days. I know Arnold. I don't give a rip what you're saying. And that kind of a bond, that kind of relationship, is a piece of the DNA that God wants us to carry. So we're going to have things arise, like anger. Remember John in a meeting with these pastors? I shared the one story, but I didn't share this. We're in this meeting, I mean, about a couple thousand leaders and pastors from around the world, and they're all upset. They were upset about several things. They were upset about Toronto. They were upset about, about the prophets. They were upset that, that basically, and, and nobody understands what, what John had to go through. You know, when, when people write books and they put a chapter out that says, um, uh, <coughs> the move of God, and, 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 uh, and then, oh, oh, oh. I did not see it. I was thinking of Are you okay? I'm fine. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. sorry. Um, and you had a chapter that's called um, uh, Barnyard Animals. And, and you're already dealing with all kinds of conflict for people who want to just tear you down daily on the radio, on TV, people coming into your meetings. We haven't had this yet. We have not had this yet. But I, I'll, I'll, I'll share some stories with you. Daily being assaulted, daily being attacked. And you tell the pastor, whatever you do, please don't publish that chapter at that time. And please don't relate the sounds that the Holy Spirit's doing as animals. It'll just draw attack. And then you go ahead and publish and release it. And you're a part of the movement they're part of. John got very, very. And people were like judging him. It's like, no, you don't understand. I was very specific. Because he says, I know what we're dealing with. If we call them animal sounds versus the Holy Ghost is moving on people and making sounds. We don't know what it is. But there's a big difference. So as a result, there was a schism, a huge schism. It was a, it was a Paul Barnum schism. It's a death. That's another point. So anger comes. It comes. And I'm we don't have to be afraid of it. We don't have to be afraid of how how manifests um, other than getting caught. Um, David got very very You can't read his songs unless you realize this dude got mad at God many times. So I want to flip the question. Put this one. God absolutely receives me and will never condemn me for being honestly angry because it's a true emotion that he's been inside of me. It's not an evil emotion. I'm not deceived. I'm not in error. It's just emotion. Because God has emotion. God has joy. God has peace. Incidentally, the separation of the emotion in you from the reality of what you're walking through is really important to understand. This is my emotion. Nobody gave me this emotion. 
Nobody made me angry. This is a natural response of having to the issues that are happening in my life. Whether, and it can be as severe as a divorce. I've seen this. It's like, it's like, they did this, they did this, they did this. Yes, but what was your reaction? What was your response? Well, I got angry and I wanted vengeance. That's what it takes. Could you have been angry legally? Absolutely. With the Lord, you could be angry. I'm angry. I'm very angry. But the, the subsequent response is what determines whether or not they harm me or allow them to do it. Okay, so why am I sharing all that? Because as we go through things together, there are going to be things that are going to remind you of things in the past. And I know that because the Lord has already spoken. We're stepping into a season right now, these three months, where God's going to hide certain things inside of you because you're in school. Every part of this is school, not just not just what we do here, not just what we do in the streets, but literally you engaged school last Friday night at the Merck. When you stepped, when, when that began, school began for you, and it's every piece of what's happening both here, home, work, or wherever you are, school, whatever it is, you are you are going to be experiencing. That's why I asked you, what's going on inside of you? Because guess what? Your buttons are about to be pushed. If they're not already pushed, why? Because those are the very buttons that God wants to give you the ability to say, and we can't push that button. I'm not controlled by that. It doesn't affect me. And does it hurt? Yeah. Do I get angry? Yeah. But do I react? Do I respond? Yeah. I get in a car wreck. The excited as me goes, why did I start the school? It was a school. What? It was a school. The school gave me a car wreck. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and those little things, boy, they can be massive on the emotions. They didn't just wreck the car. They wrecked you. They kind of go, oh, and you feel like you're going to dig yourself back out of that. It does a joy. And every time you see your car, you kind of go, man, you know, that's just, and you deal with it all over again. If you allow it to go too far, I've known people I've had to deliver from demons who were in a car with You know why? Because it became an access point. Why? Because access ways are made through emotions that respond wrong. Those are doorways. Our emotions are, are doorways to our soul. The enemy cannot do anything to your spirit. He can never demonize your spirit. You got it. You got it. You understand what I'm saying? Body, soul, spirit. He can never demonize your spirit. <clears throat> he can sow things into your life that your spirit can pick up, but he cannot demonize your spirit. But he can demonize till the cows come home, your soul, your emotions. It's the reactions. It's what happens out of us. And, and what it is, is, is we open those doors through emotions that respond in a carnal way. And incidentally, I'm not just saying, you need to know this, I'm not just saying anger. Let me pick a different one so that you, so that you begin to understand. Um, joy. Um, that's, that's, a, that's a great emotion or happiness, okay? It's a great emotion. But if you engage happiness to the realm that it produces, it, it allows you to step into areas of lust and areas where you feel like this is okay, or maybe it's not okay, but you're happy because you're doing it. What does it do? It opens that door. How, how do you get in? Through happiness. Why? Because you, you responded carnally even to the happiness. So any response of carnal nature that comes out of, out of the emotions is an access way. It's a doorway. And so the enemy can get in all kinds of ways. It's not, it's not just anger. It's it's the, the access ways. 
Is that helping? Yeah. Okay. So it's learning how, first of all, taking responsibility for, I'm angry, but I'm not going to sin. I'm angry, but I'm not going to sin. I'm not going to, I'm not going to respond in a carnal way to what's inside of me. My emotions are telling me to. The enemy for sure is nagging on me too. But I can't. I can't respond. Fear, incidentally, yes. easily gets in that way. Mm-hmm. You know, tax time? Wow. It's amazing how many people can demonize the tax time. Because they're freaking out. Like, oh my gosh, what are we going to do? Yeah. All those things can enter our lives when we, when we give carnal response to what is actually happening in our life. God has made you human. And if he wanted you perfect, he would have annihilated Adam and Eve and started again. But he did. He actually thought that he could manifest himself in and through you with all the frailties and all the weaknesses that he had. Okay, quick pause, questions, comments. You described my past few days. <laughs> to a T. Okay. Being angry, but and feeling justified, but not responding in the way that I wanted to, but taking it to the Lord. Yeah. But exactly what you were. That's been my few days. And those are things that we'll deal with. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and 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 after the class is over, you won't be done with dealing with some of the stuff. This is not going to be an instant like. We're done. We graduated. Life is not perfect. <laughs> Actually, we're going to get some of those testimonies for the next school we do. Everything became perfect. No. <laughs> okay. So, that's a piece. If we're beginning to talk about, and, and remember I said at the beginning, the thing that I liked about what the school was that they were doing in, in Mozambique. The thing that I liked was what? The culture. The culture. <clears throat> and where was the foundation of culture? It's family. Mm. It's tribal. It's like we're walking together. We carry the same DNA. That we don't we don't think one's more exalted than the other. In fact, it's very interesting. Here in the West. Heidi is seen really high. In Mozambique, she's just seen as Mama Heidi. She's seen as one of them. And there's many other mamas over there. We don't ever hear about Mama Marie and Mama. We don't hear about the other mamas who don't go speak around the world. They just do exactly what Heidi does. Yeah. That's the culture that God wants to develop in His church, it's not just us. This past weekend, some um, a leader actually said, we, we have been discussing what you're doing on uh, with the merchants, and particularly with your Tuesday night groups, because we think it's the way the church is going to be. We have to figure out how to shift it. talk about family for many, many years. But now all of a sudden family has become a husband. You're like, oh, we need family. 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 I'm the same. Family for years. I walk up to people and go, family! You know? Because I just, I love people. And that's what family is. Okay. Um, Any other comments, questions? Yeah. I don't think for the last 15 minutes, I keep seeing Bob Jones over you. Like, and I don't know what it means. I'm trying to ignore it. So I'm just saying it to you. It's to ignore that. You know, I'll tell you some secrets. Um, these, these are things I don't I don't share much. I'll probably delete this from the recording. So even if somebody misses this, they won't get this. Um, he is Bob Jones. <laughs> oh, <sorry>. <laughs> 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 I'm 